our distinguished keynote speaker, Professor Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot. What a splendid, powerful, charismatic introduction. Missing one thing. Joe forgot to tell you that he is one of my favorite students, uh, that I was his dissertation advisor, and he was a teaching fellow in my course for a couple of years. I've known him for a long time. And I feel very proud to have been his teacher and to see where he has landed and what he does so beautifully and with such style and strength. I'm deeply honored to be here this afternoon to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Carol A. and Peter S. Lynch School of Education. Birthdays are cause for festivity and fun, for applause and appreciation, for counting our blessings and rewarding our achievements. And there is plenty to celebrate in this strong and vital institution, which has become a highly respected national player in the field of education. Let's light the candles, send up the balloons, and dance till dawn. But anniversaries are also opportune moments for taking stock, for unmasking weakness, for challenging the barriers to progress, and for beginning to chart new paths, a time for self-scrutiny, for impertinent questioning, and for honest talk. The theme of this conference, Educational Equity and Excellence, and the illuminating faculty presentations that we heard earlier today underscore the complex challenges we still face in our educational institutions and in our society and reveal the mixture of successes and defeats, gains and losses that still linger in our practices and in our policies. Our schools and our society continue to struggle with joining these dual goals of academic achievement and justice. We still struggle with turning our lofty rhetoric into authentic action and social change. The Lynch School of Education embraces a social justice mission and is considered by many to be the social conscience of this university, one of the places where people are willing to take on the hard conversations, where research must stand up against the test of social reality, where as your dean put it to me and Jane Addams put it to her. You have one foot in the library and one foot in the street. This boundary crossing and bridge building between the academy and the real world brings with it a particular set of challenges that more insular institutions do not face. And it brings with it, I believe, both new responsibilities and deep accountabilities. As we work toward educational excellence, then we are challenged to deepen our witness for mercy and justice, nourish relationships that move toward trust and symmetry, and build institutions and communities that are intentionally inclusive. The scripture for today, Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4, says it more poetically and powerfully than I do. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness the prisoners to comfort all who mourn, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. These themes, secular and sacred, have been central preoccupations in my life and scholarship, my siren song, particularly for the last few years as I've explored in my research and in my writing the contours and the dimensions of respect as I have tried to shape a new view of this beautiful term. I believe that respect is the single most powerful ingredient in creating authentic relationships and in building just communities. And I also believe that respect is the essential variable in building productive, compassionate, and achieving educational cultures. We who are gathered here this afternoon, scholars and practitioners, citizens and parents, are primarily interested in supporting research, policies, and practices that will lead to educational improvement, 
those of us who are serious about improving our nation's schools, public, private, and parochial, are of course concerned about raising the achievement scores of all students, supporting the learning and development of teachers, creating curricula that are both rigorous and relevant, and finding ways of responsibly responding to the huge changes in demography of our schools created by the rapid arrival of immigrant groups. Our focus is appropriately on literacy in reading, math, and technology, on core competencies and high standards, on authentic assessment, on school reform, and on the opportunities, challenges, and distractions of vouchers and charter schools. As educators, parents, and citizens who care about education, these are our current preoccupations. These are some of the important issues that are now in vogue, issues that fill the contemporary rhetoric of our public discourse about schools that give a rationale to our educational policies and help to shape our educational practice. Even though I applaud what I regard as a new intensity and buzz of interest in school improvement and the clear focus on the centra central activity of teaching and learning, and even though I recognize the symbolic value of all of the rhetoric, I want to focus my comments this afternoon on a co concept that I regard as fundamental to good education, fundamental to the quality of engagement between teachers and students, fundamental to the development of a healthy and nourishing school culture, and ultimately fundamental to the achievement and productivity of students. And this is a quality that is timeless, not faddish, that is qualitative, not quantitative, that speaks to process and not outcomes. I believe that teaching and learning are at their very core deeply relational endeavors, that student motivation and teacher inspiration are channeled through and reinforced by relationships. And further, I believe that respect is the most powerful dimension in defining successful relationships in schools. Respect, for example, is crucial in nourishing and sustaining encounters between teachers and students. In the last 25 years, for example, I have visited literally hundreds of schools from inner, across this country, from inner city schools and poor communities to affluent suburban schools, from remote rural schools to elite preparatory academies. And in all of these schools, I've asked students to identify their good teachers and to tell me why they think they are good. The students' answers across all of these diverse settings are always the same. Why do we think Mrs. Browning is a good teacher? They ask me incredulously as if I should know the answer. Because, they say, she respects us. I push further trying to discover what they mean by respect. Again, there's no reluctance or ambivalence in their responses. They feel respected by teachers who make them feel visible and worthy, who are demanding, who hold high standards for them, who insist that they learn. And they feel disrespected or dissed by teachers who never bother to get to know them, who let them off easy, who do not take them seriously or believe that they can be successful. Respect grows in relationships of expectation, challenge, and rigor. It is diminished by inattention, indifference, and empty rituals. In A Gathering of Gifts, a beautiful book of meditations by my sister, Paula Lawrence Waymiller, who is a wise and compassionate educator and also an Episcopal priest. She recalls the weeks of grueling anticipation before her first day of school and speaks about the primal fears that we all experience when we enter new communities. Her story rehearses the raw feelings of vulnerability and yearning for visibility and voice the desire to be known. I'm quoting from A Gathering of Gifts. It is 1951, and summer has come to a steady, hot, quiet hum 
in late August. A healthy amount of boredom in the air begins to let the summer end and make way for anticipation of my first day of kindergarten, the beginning of school. My brand new first day of school dress hangs on the mirror over my bureau, red plaid, I think, with a white collar. New cotton undies and slip and soft white ankle socks are folded on the bureau. And in an open shoebox with white tissue paper unfolded enough to see them are my new red school shoes. My mother had told the salesman something sturdy in a school shoe. I had been picturing bright red patent leather party shoes and was crestfallen when Sturdy signaled the salesman to bring out brown with a tie. Mom and I must have persevered, each with our own image of what my first school shoes would be, because I ended up with ox blood red leather with a double strap and double buckles. Pretty, but sturdy. <laughs> Handsome was my father's peacemaking word for the compromised shoes. Every end of August night before going to bed, I would carefully lift the shoes out of the crisp paper, smell the fresh new leather, put them on the floor next to my feet, and think, I am going to school. I'm going to step up the big high steps onto scary, Mr. Gurky's scary big school bus, where I've heard that the big kids chant, kindergarten baby, stick your head in gravy, <laughs> when the little kids get on. I'm going to a real school in a strange new place. Will anybody know who I am? The big question. Will anybody know who I am? For teachers and students across the developmental spectrum, from kindergarten through graduate training, the question is the same. And respect is a potent and omnipresent concept. It is on our tongues and embedded in our rhetoric, it is central to our philosophical frameworks and educational vision, and it shapes our daily actions and interactions. It is therefore both practical and prophetic. But beyond our special interest in respect as a vital dimension of our work as educators, I am also drawn to the concept because it holds broad and increasing importance in our public and private lives today. Never has a dialogue about respect been more timely and more provocative than now, demanding our engagement, commitment, and attention. It is, in fact, impossible to have any conversation that refers to child rearing or teaching and learning that speaks about the human experience without our minds being flooded by the bloody images of the last year, by the tragic cataclysmic events of September 11 by the murders of innocent mothers and children in Afghanistan, by the brutal bombings and attacks in Israel and Palestine and the volatile border conflicts between India and Pakistan, by the decay and deceit at the pinnacle of Enron, Tyco, World.com, and a whole host of other corporate giants, and by the uncovering of child abuse and pedophilia by priests and bishops of the Catholic Church, violations that have a searing urgency and scarring significance here at Boston College. The symbolism and reality of these assaults, taken individually or collectively, make us feel helpless, vulnerable, victimized. Our tears express our deepest anguish, fears, confusion, and rage. Our democratic values and our civil rights seem to be crumbling around us as we work to find our moral and spiritual anchor. In our adult confusions and impotence, we struggle with finding the right words to support and guide our children and our students. During the months of acute anxiety about our fragile and troubled world, we educators, our society's public adults, have felt a particular challenge and responsibility to take care of the children in our charge, to help them come to terms with the awful 
cruel events and their aftermath, and to find a precarious balance between mourning and moving on, between revenge and reconciliation, and between grieving and getting busy. During these past several months, I have, of course, felt my share of rage and anguish. I've had my share of terrifying nightmares. But on my best days, I know that I must find ways to work more intensely, wisely, generously, that I must cut through the trivia and distractions of my everyday life and do things that have purpose and meaning, that will make an imprint, that will give forward to the next generation. More than ever, I have felt committed to enacting our democratic values, to, for example, supporting the coexistence of educational excellence and educational equality. If we are to live in this world that grows smaller and smaller, we educators must recommit ourselves to building schools that are truly inclusive. We must develop rigorous standards and goals for all children and provide the supports that our students will need in order to successfully reach them. We must develop relationships with our students that will inspire their trust, challenge their intellects, and that will have mutual respect at their center. We have said these things for a long time with the best of intentions, but over the years, our rhetoric about justice and respect has begun to sound stale and over-rehearsed, much too facile. The shadows of darkness and violence that have preoccupied us recently compel us to recognize how very precious and fragile are our democratic principles, how very hard it is to sustain and nourish respect, and how complex the work of authentic inclusivity turns out to be. So let me tell you what I mean by respect. Identify the six dimensions of respect that I explore in my book and focus on one of those dimensions by telling you the story of one wonderful practitioner of respect. I will close my talk this, this evening with seven lessons that I hope will challenge us to think deeply and act courageously as we pursue the dual goals of educational equity and excellence. So what do I mean by respect? Respect is commonly seen as deference to status and hierarchy, as driven by duty, honor, and a desire to avoid punishment, shame, and embarrassment. This traditional view of respect, though rarely expressed in its pure form, tends to be relatively static and impersonal. My work shapes a new view of respect, Usually, respect is seen as involving some sort of debt due people because of their attained or inherent position, their age, their gender, their class, race, professional status, or accomplishments. Whether defined by the rules of law or the habits of culture, respect often implies required expressions of esteem, approbation, and submission. By contrast, I focus on the way that respect creates symmetry, empathy, and connection in all kinds of relationships, even those such as parent and child, teacher and student, doctor and patient, commonly seen as unequal. Rather than looking for respect as a given in certain relationships, I'm interested in watching it develop over time. I believe that respect generates respect a modest loaf becomes many. With that in mind, I'm interested in how people work to challenge and dismantle hierarchies rather than how they reinforce and reify them, as well as with the ways in which the context, that is the situation or the setting of the healer and patient, parent and child, teacher and student, priest and parishioner, photographer and subject shapes the ways in which people engage in respectful relationships. Since I focus on individuals, it is important to consider how family roots, temperament, and life stories shape the ways in which people are able to become respectful and respected. Rather than the language of inhibition and constraint, typical of a more old-fashioned view of respect, 
I listen for the voices of challenge and exuberance. Rather than the language of dutiful compliance, I hear the words of desire and commitment. Rather than the broad and esoteric abstractions of philosophers so distant from the complexities of people's lives, I watch for the details of action and try to decipher the nuances of thought and feeling. In my book, which moves across the life cycle from birth to death, I identify six dimensions of respect. I warn you not to be heard as discrete ingredients of a prescribed recipe, but rather as a framework for considering the rich experiential complexity of the term. Each dimension reveals a different angle of vision. So let me briefly define each of these six dimensions of respect and then turn to the story of one of the protagonists in the book, one of the folks who I think of as an exemplary practitioner of respect. The first dimension of respect that I explore is empowerment. When we are respectful of others, we want to offer them the knowledge, skills, and resources that they need that will allow them to make their own decisions and take control of their lives. So the first is empowerment. The second dimension of respect that I examine is healing. Healing. In showing respect for another, we hope through our work and actions to nourish a feeling of worthiness, wholeness, and well-being in them. The third dimension is dialogue. Dialogue. In showing respect for another, we encourage authentic communication. We listen carefully. We respond supportively. We are willing to move through misunderstandings, distortions, conflict, and anger towards reasoning and reconciliation. The fourth dimension, and one of my favorites, the one on which I will focus my remarks this afternoon, is curiosity. Curiosity. When we are respectful of others, we are genuinely interested in them. We want to know who they are and what they are thinking, feeling, and fearing. We want to know their stories, and we want to know their dreams. The fifth dimension of respect is, of course, self-respect. In order to show respect to another, we must feel good about ourselves. Self-respect, however, must not be confused with narcissism or entitlement. It results from a growing self-confidence that does not seek external validation or public affirmation. It is learning to live by our own internal compass, one defined by a daily private vigilance. And the final dimension of respect that I explore is attention, attention. When we are respectful of another, we offer our full and undiluted attention. We are fully present, we are completely in the room, sometimes engaged in vigorous conversation, sometimes bearing silent witness. I want to talk to you folks about curiosity and its messenger, a man named Dayud Bey, because I think it is perhaps the quality of respect that surprises and enhances our view more than any other. Curiosity, it seems so innocent, so ordinary, so doable, and it seems to be the least tainted by political hype or tired rhetoric. It also seems so fundamental to relationships of all kinds, relationships between lovers, between parents and children, between teachers and students, between priests and parishioners, among colleagues, all kept alive by genuine curiosity, by wanting to know and be known, by the search for knowledge, by discovery, openness, and attention to newness and change, by making oneself vulnerable to hearing things painful or incoherent. And curiosity is fundamental to the quest for justice and the commitment to inclusivity. 
individually and institutionally, we must be genuinely interested in the stranger's voice and in the challenges and opportunities that his or her perspective will bring. As an artist and photographer, Dayud Bey creates larger-than-life-size color portraits that allow us into the psyche of his subjects. His work hangs in all the major museums across this country and across the world. When Dayud talks about his art, he points to the development of a relationship with his subjects at the center of his work. If most of us think of photographers with a camera held up in front of their faces, using their equipment as mask or barrier, hiding out while they expose others, then Dayud Bey stands up in defiant contrast. He believes that photographers must enter into relationships with their subjects that are mutual and symmetric, where both photographer and subject are unmasked, making way for trust and dialogue. His photography is more about discovery, more about finding out what's true for each person through listening to his or her stories than it is about presenting a likable portrayal. It is more about witnessing the holy in each of his subjects about bestowing on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. For him, photography begins always with a deep curiosity. I'm endlessly curious, Dayud says, about the primary motivation that defines his respectful regard of people with whom he works. In his early 20s, Dayud began his career hanging out in the streets of central Harlem in New York City streets that were both exotic and familiar to this middle-class boy from Queens. For five years, from 1975 to 1980, he worked to develop his unique approach to making pictures about the human experience. His hanging out, however, was methodical. He would select a particular area, usually a 10-block square, like between 125th Street and 135th Street, moving from east to west, and he would land there each day with his 35-millimeter camera hanging around his neck. For several days, he wouldn't take any pictures, just stand around, approach people, and begin a conversation. Sometimes he'd go to the same bus stop for several days in a row and begin to recognize the people who would arrive at the same time each day. They would also begin to notice him, and eventually they'd strike up a conversation. This was very hard for me, admits Dayud. I was an incredibly shy person by temperament. As a child, I was very reticent. I was a stutterer, fearful of reaching out. I think making pictures was the way I began to engage people, the way I came out of my shyness. But even as a novice, Dayud knew that photographs grew out of relationships and that the process had to be reciprocal. This reciprocity usually emerged out of the sharing of stories. Courageously pushing past his reticence, Dayud forced himself to reach out to folks and make a connection. Sometimes he had to begin the storytelling in order for people to feel moved to carry on, but once the ball got rolling, he found that one story encouraged others. Before you knew it, afternoon had slipped into evening and an atmosphere of reciprocity had emerged. The stories were usually inspired by a question, by genuine curiosity about the other person, and the curiosity could not be faked. Despite his shyness, Dayud thinks that part of the reason he was able to learn how to reach out to people was because his father was an amazingly friendly and gregarious man who had the ability to engage anyone. He could stand on the street all day and enjoy talking to anybody about anything. Dayud rem remembers how his father, Ken, would stop and talk to the man selling hot dogs on the corner. His curiosity was provoked by anybody. He'd ask the guy how long he'd been selling hot dogs, who his supplier was, how much profit he made, and so on, endlessly curious. But it was not only that Ken was eager to engage in conversation that amazed his son. It was also his ability to connect with all kinds of people, whatever their status or station. Ken was an electrical engineer by training, and he usually held the position of manager or director 
in whatever shop he worked, but he never used the power of his position to diminish others or to pull rank. Dayud remembers visiting his dad at work and never having the sense that he was the boss. He had an easy relationship with all the men and women he worked with. Dayud loved his father's curiosity, his gregariousness, and his e the even-handed way that he dealt with everyone around him. Even though he grew up feeling awkward and shy, so different from his father's ease and cool, Dayud must have absorbed some of this social inheritance. In his early days, meeting people and taking pictures in Harlem, a part of his father seemed to grow up in him. When Dayu describes the curiosity and the commitment that are part of his work and the depth and complexity that he strives for, he takes me on a flashback to his second grade teacher at PS 123. When he photographs his subjects and bathes them in light, he wants to feel seen like he felt seen in Mrs. Jones's classroom. Mrs. Jones, he recalls, was profound and extraordinary and very inspiring. In what way profound, I ask, somewhat surprised at a word that seems to go beyond most people's recall of second grade. His response is immediate. She established real relationships with every single child in her class, he recalls. Everything was possible and everybody could do it. Ever since second grade, all of Dayud's other teachers and all of his other educational experiences have been measured against Mrs. Jones's amazing skill and compassion, and they have all come up wanting. By the third grade, Dayud's parents had enrolled their son in PS 131, a higher achieving white school where he was the only black child in his class where he remembers feeling an uneasy, unnamed anxiety every time he stepped off the bus and into the school. Dayud recalls an incident in fourth grade when one of the little girls got her lunch stolen and he looked up to find the teacher singling him out. He saw her cold stare and her accusatory finger waving in his face and he felt baffled and confused. I was innocent, I didn't even get the connection. Me? He stammered, are you talking about me? Dayud asked in a sweat. Yes. She meant him, and he was to go down to the guidance office immediately. He was the culprit. There was no doubt in her mind. Dayud rose up from his seat, walked the long march to the door amid the quiet stares of his classmates, and dutifully took himself to the guidance office, where the counselor interpreted his acting out as some kind of mental problem and gave him some weird tests putting square pegs in round holes. In Dayud's memory, this is one story among many. I'd get singled out, he remembers. Much of the time I was in a conflicted state. There were strange things going on, but what do you say? I couldn't name what was happening, and I couldn't find the words or the courage to ask. The following year, in fifth grade, he remembers that the class was writing a group play about colonial America, and the play was to be written in verse. Dayud loved the assignment, and he leapt right into the middle of the work. The teacher was gratified by the way her class pulled off the assignment so quickly and with such apparent ease and mature collaboration. She inquired of everyone how they had been so incredibly productive and the children all pointed to Dayud, who smiled back shyly. I remember, says Dayud, with hurt in his eyes, how her expression changed in that moment. The raised eyebrow, the amazement, the surprise. She must have applauded his inspired work and thanked him for his contribution, but the only thing that Dayud can remember is her utter bafflement and his inner confusion. The teacher was unable to reconcile his brightness with her stereotype of him. How could this black boy produce this verse? She seemed tormented by this. 
Dayud's tales of being painfully misunderstood, the ways in which his teachers at PS 131 were blinded by their prejudice, remind me of the opening passages of Ralph Ellison's classic novel, Invisible Man, a book published just before Dayud was born. I quote from the beginning paragraphs of Ellison's book. I am an invisible man. No, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, of fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Like the bodiless heads you see sometimes in circus sideshows, it is as though I have been surrounded by mirrors of hard, distorted glass. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. End quote. The plight of Ellison's invisible man echoes through Dayud's later childhood stories. He suffered what Ellison describes as the construction of their inner eyes, and he learned the hard way that to exist we must be visible. The contrast between the biased oversight of his white teachers at PS 131 and the full empathic attention bestowed by Mrs. Jones surely influenced Dayud's approach to his art. His photographs, motivated by curiosity, shaped by a commitment to his subjects and their consent, allow his subjects to express themselves bathed in respectful attention. Our celebration of this momentous occasion the half-century birthday of the Lynch School of Education, shines the light on your wonderful accomplishments and illuminates the great challenges ahead. Your purpose, your mission, your commitment, your institutional self-portrait might be informed by Dayud Bey's masterful and compassionate lens. Threaded through his story, we see the daily acts of justice, the warm embrace of inclusivity, and the relentless curiosity that says yes to little sister Paula's haunting question, will anybody know who I am? So in closing, let me offer up seven challenging lessons. It's because I can't resist being the teacher that I believe are important for those of us who want to honor the social justice mission of the Lynch School of Education, for those of us who want to nurture educational cultures that join excellence and equity, for those of us who want to build bridges across the borders of theory and practice, the library and the streets, across the separations of class, race, gender, and religion and for those of us who want to build families, communities, and schools based on relationships of respect. So here they are. The first lesson is on symmetry, on symmetry. We need to reconstruct our images of and metaphors for respect. The old views of respect that emphasize hierarchy, approbation, and obedience based on habit, ritual or law, tend to lead to relationships that are static, asymmetric, and constraining. People become stuck in their roles of power or impotence, responsibility or irresponsibility, and are neither challenged nor inspired to try on other personas or develop new ways of being. Respect that is symmetric and dynamic, on the other hand, supports growth and change encourages communication and authenticity and allows generosity and empathy to flow in two directions. The image I want you to have is one of a circle, not a triangle or a pyramid. From this new perspective, differences in power, strength, 
and expertise may remain, but it is the respect that creates a relational and generative equality. My second lesson is on relationship. Respect grows in relationship, and it is shaped by the context. I cannot possibly envision respect in the abstract. It is grounded in individual reciprocity and engagement, defined by the immediacy of the moment and the constraints of the setting. It is visceral, palpable, conveyed through gesture, nuance, tone of voice, and figure of speech. One of the reasons that to dis, to dis, has become a verb spoken by all of us, not just cool talking adolescents, is because it seems to capture in one sharp syllable the potency of respect not given, the moment when we are suddenly made to feel diminished, dismissed, and demeaned. Those of us seeking to nourish respect then must see its embeddedness in growing relationships and appreciate the immediate and visceral way it is transmitted. My third lesson is on civility, on civility. It is important that we not confuse respect with civility. Although these notions are related, they are certainly not the same. Civility refers to the rituals, routines, and habits of decorum that characterize a gracious encounter. We think of the etiquette of politeness and manners, an important but relatively surface engagement. Respect certainly includes attention to these rituals of civility, but it goes deeper. It penetrates below the polite surface and reflects a growing sense of connection empathy and trust. It requires seeing the other as genuinely worthy. In the more powerful language of Isaiah, it requires that we bestow on the stranger the garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. This is a garment, of course, that reveals. It does not mask, inhibit, or hide. And my fourth lesson is on storytelling. Storytelling is at the center of respectful encounters. Stories lubricated by a genuine curiosity, authentic questioning, and attentive listening. Stories also allow for rapport and identification across the boundaries of class, race, gender, prejudice, and fear. Through the unique and specific aspects of each other's stories, we discover the universals among us. And remember, stories are not exclusive property. One story invites another as people's words weave the tapestry of human connection. And my fifth lesson is on language, which I love, language. If we are to make progress towards an authentic pluralism, a real diversity of voices in schools and in higher education, then I think we have to listen carefully to the language we use and get rid of code labels like inner city, like at risk, like urban, that are masks for words we refuse to say in the politically correct environments we tend to inhabit. And we have to strike, or at least, revive and reinvest in tired terms like multiculturalism and diversity that have lost their punch and lost their challenge. One of the reasons that I love the word curiosity so much is because it is so plain, so core, and so untarnished. If we really practice curiosity, we will be genuinely interested in understanding the colors and differences in our midst. We will be eager to get to know the stranger. My sixth and penultimate lesson is on family origins. The imprint of family is powerful in shaping the ways we each negotiate respectful relationships. 
as we try to create relationships that are nourishing and challenging, that have respect at their very center, we often confront the ghosts of our parents, the haunts of our early experiences as a child. These echoes can be inspiring. We create relationships that have the imprint of our parents' empathy and generosity. This was the good fortune of Dayud Bey, who inherited his father's irrepressible warmth and curiosity. But others of us must work to challenge harsh and troubling generational echoes. We have to try hard not to unleash on others the assaults our parents wittingly or unwittingly inflicted upon us. Our determination to become teachers and healers may in fact be inspired by the deep residues of pain inflicted by abusive parents. As healers engaged in respectful encounters, we hope to do the opposite, act out of compassion and empathy, restraint and connection, and in so doing, heal ourselves. And my seventh and final lesson after all of this talk, after all of this text, after all of this language, after all of these words, my seventh and final lesson is on silence, on silence. Respect is not just carried through talk. It is also conveyed through silence. I do not mean an empty, distracted silence. I mean a fully engaged silence that permits us to think, feel, breathe, and take notice. A silence that allows us to meditate and be prayerful. A silence that gives the other person permission to let us know what he or she needs. In nourishing respectful relationships, then, we must develop receptive antenna take on the role of witness and learn to live in the stillness. At the still point, at the still point, says T.S. Eliot in his famous poem, Four Quartets, there is the dance. Birth and death join at such moments, inviting our deep curiosity and our full attention. For the dying, and I believe for the living, the immediate moment is the most significant. Here we are this afternoon on the half-century birthday of the Lynch School. Here we are at Boston College, communing together. Now is the time. Now is always. <laughs>